Good evening. So that was a medley about immigration and slavery and empire and race and all the things we'll be kind of discussing tonight. My name is Gaston Alonso. I am the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College. I am both incredibly honored and excited to welcome you to today's event, Defining Immigration, Empire, Race, and Slavery, with Professor Kevin Kenny from New York University and Professors Gunja Sengupta and Anna Law from Brooklyn College. Let me take this time to thank our sponsors, the Curse Chair in Constitutional Law of Brooklyn College, Anna Law, who will lead today's discussion, the Office of the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, and Dean Napoli is with us tonight, so welcome, uh, the Departments of Africana Studies, Anthropology, Classics, Communication, Arts, Sciences, and, Disorder, and, and Disorders, English, Judaic Studies, Philosophy, Political Science, Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies, Sociology, the Programs in Communications and Studies in Religion, the Center for the Study of Brooklyn and the Haitian Studies Institute and the Immigrant, uh, Immigrant Student Success Office. This is a very long list of sponsors. There is a lot of in, uh, excitement in uh, the college for today's uh, event. Before we start, I do wanna let you know about a related series of events that the Wolf Institute is hosting this semester on the philosophy of immigration. We had the first event on that series last night. Some of you were there, so thanks for joining us again. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. And I wanna invite you to join us for the next two events in that series. Um, in the chat, we have shared the link uh, to that information. It's a great way to continue the conversation that we're gonna have this evening. I also want to invite you during the first week of April to Hess Week, a series of public events organized to honor the work of this year's Hess Scholar in Residence at Brooklyn College, historian, uh, historian Paul Ortiz to the University of Florida. We got eight events, 25 speakers in four days. Important conversations about academic freedom, the crisis of democracy, the role of solidarity, in defending both and the revolutionary potential of oral history. And we have shared, we're sharing the link um, for this, the link for the week's program in the chat. Please join us for that the first week of April. And lastly, please follow the Wolf Institute on social media to learn about our upcoming programming. And the links to those pages will be also in the chat. And with that, let me introduce to you my colleague in political science, Professor Anna Law, who will be today's uh, host. Um, Anna Law is the Hearst Curse Chair in Constitutional Rights and an Associate Professor of Political Science at Brooklyn College. Professor Law specializes in public law, American federalism, and US immigration policy and history. She's the author of The Immigration Battle in American Courts, Cambridge University Press, and she's currently work at work on a book length project that brings together slavery and migration as a way to illustrate the wide influence that slave policy and federal Indian law had on voluntary migration law. Thank you to all of you for joining us and please welcome Professor Law. Thank you. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, I wanted to extend my welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening. We have two authors of two uh, new and exciting books and thanks to the library. Um, thank you, Helen Gurgis at the library. You can have unlimited access to both books. Totally legal and above board. We did pay the, their correct fees, uh, just so both authors know. So you can have un, uh, unlimited online access to both books after you hear this talk. And if you're curious to read about uh, more about the books. The, I also want to thank all the academic departments and units that have uh, sponsored this event, and especially the Wolf Institute and Gaston and Kiana um, and their staff, because I, I simply couldn't run programming without them because the Curse Chair has no staff. So um, thank you. The, I have the honor at Brooklyn College of occupying the Herbert Curse Chair in Constitutional Rights. And I, um, I teach classes in the political science department on federal courts and um, constitutional law. And I'm in my 12th year at Brooklyn College. And Herbert Kurtz was an alum 
of Brooklyn College. And he was most concerned after he graduated about the limits and the possibilities of the constitution and of law in protecting politically unpopular minority groups. So it's with the CURS funding uh, that I'm able to run events like this one. So, and I, I try to do one of these every year or every other year. So keep a lookout on, uh, for them. I've learned from moderating these book events that the best way to go is to get audience participation soon, sooner rather than later, because we want this to be a dialogue um, and we don't want this to be a monologue. So here's what I thought we would do tonight. I will introduce both speakers and then I've asked each speaker to talk for about 12 minutes about to tell us about their books that some of you may not have read. And um, I've informed them that I will rudely interrupt them if they go over the time. And, you know, we're in awards season. So like the music is gonna play, Gaston's gonna play the music and like a good looking lady is gonna come like lead you off the stage if you go over. So um, after the, uh, the two speakers get a chance to describe their books, I will then throw out two questions to both, for both of them to address and immediately go to Q&A. So um, let me start by introducing uh, Professor Gunja Sangupta, my colleague in the history department at Brooklyn College. And she also teaches at the Graduate Center. Her current research and teaching interests lie in the 19th century uh, US history with the global context of slavery and colonialism. And she will be talking to us tonight about her book, Sojourners, Sultans and Slaves, America and the Indian Ocean in the Age of Abolition and Empire. Uh, this is the most recent, and she has two other books and many numerous articles. And her work has been funded by fellowships and grants awarded by the Mrs. Giles Whiting, the Wolf, the Tao Mellon Foundations, among others and most recently by the CUNY Mellon funded Black Race and Ethnic Studies Initiative. So I'm so glad that um, Gunja's book is, there's, there's a synergy between these two books. They don't, there is a lot of overlap between what they talk about, but they address the same research question in very different ways that we'll see. Um, I would also like to introduce Kevin Kenny, who's the Glucksman Professor of History at NYU where he teaches the history of US immigration and global migration. Tonight, he's talking to us about his latest book, The Problem of Immigration in a Slaveholding Republic, Policing Mobility in the 19th Century United States. Uh, he is also the author of four other books and many numerous articles and edited volumes. Professor Kenny currently serves as the president of the Immigration and Ethnic History Society and he is a distinguished lecturer at the Organization of American Historians. Now, from a, a personal standpoint, how I met Professor Kenny was every academic's worst nightmare. <laughs> Midway through me writing my book on a very similar topic. Seven years to be exact, in the middle of writing my book, I met Kevin who is writing a very similar book. And his book was going to be out several years before mine. So I was presented with multiple options at that point. Do I ignore the man and pretend he doesn't exist? Do I throw shade on social media? Do I, you know, issue a challenge of pistols at dawn? Do I invite him to my home? and you know, for a cask of Amontillado. So I chose a different option, which is to invite him to my campus to give a book talk in conjunction with another colleague who's published a book which, which has many different overlapping and, and uh, themes that we can, we can ping off each other. So with for, no further ado, let me, um, Kevin, why don't you start? And, and then we'll go to Gunja after that. Right, uh, wonderful. Um, 
So I'm so delighted to, to be here. And let me begin by thanking uh, Gaston Alonso and the Wolf Institute and the staff at the Institute. Um, also want to uh, recognize an old friend from a former life in New York, Phil Napoli, uh, who's uh, in the meeting. And of course, uh, Anna Law uh, for this um, wonderful uh, invitation to, uh, to be part of uh, Brooklyn College uh, this evening. And uh, Anna also for uh, not greeting uh, the fact that we work on similar topics with pistols at dawn, uh, which might be an appropriate response. But indeed, uh, we've become uh, uh, very good friends uh, by virtue of uh, working on a similar topic uh, from the vantage point of different disciplines. And I, I think if we discover one thing this evening, uh, it'll be that there's a lot to say uh, on, on this subject. So I'm going to... Um, with pistols at dawn in mind, I'm going to stick very closely to my allotted uh, 12 minutes, maybe do it in less, and just tell you a little bit about the book uh, that I wrote. Very different kind of history for me, a new kind of history, because I spent my career writing what we call history from below, history from the bottom up, the history of ordinary migrants making their lives, sometimes involved in social protest. And I never, um, it, you know, in my previous work, I never stopped to consider the question, who claimed authority over immigration and on what grounds? Who claimed authority over immigration and on what grounds? Because, you know, if you step back from that, that's an extraordinary claim to make, that somebody can control the bodies and the mobility uh, of other uh, humans. And that's what led me into this uh Question. Now, in a place like the United States, uh, I'm a historian of the United States, um, you can look for answers to questions like that in the Constitution. Uh, the US is very distinctive in, in having a written Constitution that sets down uh, rules and guidelines for uh, who can do what. And the really striking thing about the US Constitution uh, for a country like the United States, which is famous for attracting so many immigrants from more places and in greater numbers than any place else, the really striking thing is if you go to the Constitution, it is silent on immigration. It doesn't say anything about immigration per se. It does establish a rule for naturalizing foreigners uh, after they enter the country, but that's a slightly different question. And so that's pretty, pretty um, interesting if you think about it. And then um, if you then discover that for the first century of the American Republic, in other words, from the Constitution through Reconstruction, that Congress was playing virtually no role in immigration policy outside naturalization, you know, that, then the mystery uh, deepens because a federal immigration policy did not emerge in this country until the 1860s and 1870s. It's no coincidence that it emerged when it did during the Civil War and Reconstruction, because the argument of my book is uh, quite simply this. The central claim is that the existence, abolition, and legacies of slavery shaped American immigration policy as it moved from the local to the national level over the course of the 19th century. So that's my book in a nutshell, that uh, you move from local to state to federal control. And if you want to understand that transition, which took a whole century, I argue that you can understand it in a number of ways, but you can understand it fundamentally through uh, the existence, abolition, and legacies of slavery. Okay, so I'm going to touch on just a few aspects of that claim in this conversation, and then uh, look forward so much to, to the discussion of uh, Gunja Sengupta's book, which will broaden uh, the, the uh, scope of this inquiry so much, because mine is deliberately a national story. I'm just trying to figure out this question in uh, the United States. It's kind of an unusual thing for, an, for me to do, because I'm an immigration historian. My work is always transnational. But here I just wanted to figure out how it worked uh, with, within the United States. So I want to touch on, um, if I can, uh, either four or five aspects of the argument. And Anna, just cut me off uh, when, when I um, get past uh, 10 minutes from now. Uh, the first is the extent to which the federal government was involved in regulating human mobility. The second 
is what the Constitution does and does not say about immigration. The third is the impact of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And then finally, I want to look at the ultimate claim that is made by the federal government to control immigration in the context of Chinese exclusion. The last point I'll touch on, and this can wait until the Q&A, is how the implications of all of this, what we call immigration federalism, uh, continue to play out in the present. Right. So that, that's what I want to do very briefly in, in, in these 10 minutes. So if we look at what the federal government was doing in the 19th century to control human uh, mobility, we can look firstly at the uh, federal slave, uh, excuse me, the fugitive slave clause of the Constitution, which uh, authorizes um, Congress to uh, deliver back uh, fugitives uh, to the United States. And then that is enacted in law in 1793 and again in 1850. And what I argue in the book is that the system of forced and arbitrary removal of uh, uh, free and um, uh, fugitive enslaved people, uh, although it was directed uh, at African Americans, obviously, uh, does provide one of the few precedents we have uh, for subsequent deportation law. So legal scholars have tried to look at that connection between the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and the system of deportation that emerges after that. Second area where the federal government is involved is what's euphemistically called the colonization movement. That's the removal of about 11,000 uh, emancipated and free African-Americans out of the country uh, with federal uh, endorsement and support, financial support, on the grounds that they could never become uh, free and equal citizens in the United States. The third area is what was called Indian removal. Uh, the, the removal of uh, 80,000 and more uh, Native Americans from the Southeast, for example, under the machinery of the Indian Removal Act. Okay, so the federal government was involved in uh, regulating uh, mobility in, in those ways, uh, what it was not involved in doing, except in minimal ways, was regulating immigration in the sense of a voluntary movement, primarily from Europe, uh, also uh, from China uh, in this period. The Constitution, as I mentioned, says nothing about immigration. It says something about naturalization. It's a remarkably liberal uh, policy that it lays down. For, uh, if you're a foreigner, if you uh, live in the country for five years, take an oath of allegiance, prove um, um, good character, you can become a citizen. It's how I became a citizen. It's the same uh, rule that we have today. I can stake an equal claim to being an American, even though I wasn't born here. But of course, there's a catch. It applies to free white persons only. Not until 1870 can people of African origin or descent become uh, immigrants, uh, can they become citizens? And unbelievably, when you encounter it first, not until the 1940s and 1950s is that ban lifted on Asian immigrants. It's, it's staggering, uh, uh, but it's true. Okay, so that's naturalization. But what about uh, regulating the arrival of um, immigrants, voluntary uh, immigrants, the, the admission, exclusion, or deportation, removal of immigrants? Well, there are a few parts of the Constitution where you might look for authority over that. Uh, things like the Taxing and Spending Clause, the War Powers Clause, the Treaty Power Clause is also important because immigration policy is made by treaty. But the bottom line uh, before the Civil War and Reconstruction is that Congress is doing very, very little in this area. It, uh, to the extent that um, a constitutional power is invoked, it's under the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states within and with the Indian tribes. But here's the, um, here's the key. Federal commerce power might have regulated immigration, but there's something else going on in a federal republic. Power is divided between the center, 
and the localities, between the federal government and the states. The states reserve power over uh, those er domains that they have not specifically delegated to the federal government. And I'm arguing that one of the most important of those powers is the regulation of the ability to move. And this is where it gets interesting in the context of a slaveholding republic, because the states exert what's called their police power, their power to police their own communities, to quarantine sick passengers, to require ship captains to post bond and pay taxes for foreign paupers in case they become a public charge, and connected to that to patrol the movement of free and enslaved black people, including black sailors who visit uh, from other ports, uh, within the states and between the states, right? So my argument is that the constitutional battle over human mobility in the 19th century uh, puts federal commerce power up against local police power in ways where any judicial or political decision over immigration has really strong ramifications for the movement of free black people internally uh, within states and between the states. And believe me, Southern slave enslavers are looking at all of the court cases that come up and say, you know, if Congress has control over European immigration, what does that mean? Does Congress, can Congress also control our laws regulating the movement of free black people within our states, between the states? Maybe Congress will even interfere with the institution of slavery and with the interstate slave trade, right? So that's what my book is about. Third point of, of the five I'm, I may make, I may only make four. Third point is the impact of the Civil War and Reconstruction. You could say that the Civil War and Reconstruction remove the political and constitutional obstacles to a national immigration policy. It enables a national immigration policy to emerge. The political obstac obstacles, because 11 states have seceded from the Union, they're not in Congress. The constitutional obstacles, because once slavery is removed, the Supreme Court has no difficulty in 1875 in declaring unanimously that control over immigration by extension movement mobility is a federal matter. They were never able to say that uh, during the era of slavery. But here's, the, here's one thing I want to warn against. It would be a mistake to assume that uh, Congress would have stepped in and regulated immigration earlier if slavery had been removed, say, two generations earlier. But what do I mean by that? I mean that Nobody before the late 19th century was trying to numerically restrict the arrival of European immigrants. People didn't like the Irish, that, that's for sure. Um, there was cultural prejudice against them, but nobody was saying we should, we should numerically restrict European immigration. That's much later. That's in the 1890s. So there's another mystery here. There has to be something else going on. There has to be another historical contingency. And that is the arrival of the Chinese. Because a federal immigration policy is possible because of the abolition of slavery, but it's implemented against Chinese immigrants. And I would argue that the system that's, in, that's introduced to regulate and exclude and deport and punish uh, Chinese immigrants, again, has its only precedence at state level uh, in uh, slave codes and free black codes. I'm not saying it's the same thing. I'm just saying if I look for precedents for how the Chinese uh, were treated, I find them at the local level in the antebellum South. Ultimately, the claim for federal authority that emerges uh, in the late 19th century, that w w when the idea of what we call a plenary power over um, immigration in the sense of arrivals, admissions, exclusions, the plenary power over immigration is laid down in the 1870s and 1880s in the context of emancipation. And it is what happens is some Chinese immigrants uh, challenge uh, what the federal government is doing. The Supreme Court is asked to rule on the grounding for authority the Supreme Court says, in effect, that this is an extra constitutional power, that it is in the, the very nature of independent nations, that it's an inherent 
attribute, a power inherent in the sovereignty of nations to control your borders. You don't have to find that in the text of the Constitution. You can't be an independent nation if you don't do that. That's what we call the uh, the doctrine of power inherent in sovereignty and the plenary power uh, over immigration. Why is that relevant? Because, for example, uh, six years ago in Trump versus Hawaii, the Supreme Court upheld Trump's travel ban against uh, Muslim immigrants on precisely those grounds. It invoked the Chinese exclusion case you. of 1889. And I'm, I'm actually going to end right there uh, by saying that uh, if you look at Trump versus Hawaii, you'll see that claim upheld. And then in the Q&A, I might get to point number five, I, I thought I wouldn't, which is how some of this is playing out today. And I don't have to tell you how it's playing out if you see migrants being bussed uh, from Texas or Florida into New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kenny. That all sounded really familiar. I have no <laughs> idea why. Um, Professor Sengupta, please go ahead. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, Gaston, Kiana, the Wolf Institute for organizing this event all our uh, sponsors and co-sponsors for getting on board, Kevin for being here, and my amazing, brilliant students um, who um, I promise you I'm not going to go on and on. And um, Anna, yes, start some of that Gaston, that some of that amazing music that you were playing if I do speak longer than I should. Um, so I read Kevin's book with great interest and um, decided to tailor my remarks, I hope they're going to be really brief, around a theme that I see both of us sharing, uh, namely, how did the international politics of slavery, empire, and migration intersect in the 19th century? Now, migration stories lie at the heart of my book. Um, and these uh, stories are set in the 19th century. In the 19th century, as many of you know, the spread of capitalism, um, empire, information technologies of print, transport, communication were weaving North America with the rest of the world into international networks of exchange and contest, encounter, exchange context. And what emerges is this global public square, right? Uh, for debating slavery and freedom. And this is an incredibly interconnected world. So that something that happens in rural India, for example, uh, an experiment to grow uh, free cotton reverberates in the slavery politics of a Mississippi. Uh, and so in this book, what uh, we do is to track the movement of people, of commodities, of ideas, of goods among nodes, of uh, commercial exchange, uh, imperial power rivalries, and human activism. And where do these, where are these nodes located? Well, all the way from Anglo-America uh, through the Swahili coast of East Africa, the Persian Arabian Gulf into South Asia. Now, what you find is that Americans on all sides of the slavery debate are uh, sort of intricately networked into intercontinental uh, coalitions. Uh, now, these intercontinental coalitions include human rights activists and marginalized people, and they're pitted against slave trading and slave holding interests, stretching all the way from uh, Charleston through Salem, Manchester, London, Zanzibar, Kutch, Katyawar, Calcutta, right? Um, and so as we tell their stories in the book, we uh, move through disparate local and global locales. Um, we visit Caribbean emancipation celebrations in Northampton, Massachusetts. We visit the counting houses of American consuls and merchants in Zanzibar. We peek into cotton farms run by Mississippi overseers in British India. Uh, we uh, visit the magnificent estate of this Union soldier turned slaveholder uh, in the Comoros, a slave holding sugar baron in the Comoros Islands in the Indian Ocean. We also traverse the slaving paths of East Africa. 
and the Arabian Peninsula into the uh, mercantile establishments, the plantations, and the zananas or, or women's quarters uh, in East Africa. And we crossed. Hmm? Uh, we, uh, cross, we crossed. We crossed. Of slavers and anti slavers. I know, I didn't get wet. Gunja, you're muted. Uh, Gunja, uh, if everyone could turn their microphone off except for Gunja, we would appreciate that. Oh dear, was I? Just was... the last couple of minutes. Oh, just the last couple of, oh. <laughs> so you did hear the early, uh, where did you, uh, at what point <laughs> could you not hear me? You were finishing describing the different kind of the, the, the historical details of the different um, locales. The locales that you take us to in the book. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, uh, we crossed the ship decks of slavers and anti slavers uh, into the safe houses and police stations of South Asian towns on the trail of enslaved women and children. And along the way, we meet East Africans who are uh, fleeing to Massachusetts on American merchant ships, Africans landed in India on Arab vessels, and Indian concubines in the Persian Arabian Gulf, among many other characters. So the question uh, for this session is, what can these migrations, whether voluntary or forced, tell us about the international politics of slavery and freedom. Now, what I'd like to do is to illustrate this by focusing on examples of some marginalized women in uh, different continents. Uh, now, these women, remember, in the 19th century are navigating landscapes deeply divided over slavery. An imperial power is looming over these divisions. Um, in the high seas and in the lands that border, border these high seas. We're, of course, talking about the British Empire, which had emerged from the American Revolution, um, uh, seizing upon what historians have described as the moral capital of anti-slavery, right? So Britain was, as it advanced into Afro-Asia, it starts describing itself as an anti-slavery empire defined against America's expanding republic of slavery. And historians have suggested that anti-slavery activism functioned at least partly as a way of securing the moral and material foundations of imperialism. So, the question then, one of the central questions of the book is how do enslaved women and children use the language, the symbols, the institutions of anti-slavery diplomacy to um, uh, uh, gain some uh, control over their own lives, right? To define freedom, to uh, define community, uh, to seek security from poverty and violence. And so at this point, let me share some, start sharing uh, some slides with you uh, to give you a sense of how we might read these sources. Um, if you can't see this, do let me uh, know. Um, so why don't we start uh, in uh, the North Atlantic? In the Atlantic world, what you find is that a lot of African-American women, whether enslaved or free, are seeking to reinvent themselves by crossing the borders erected by the language and institutions of imperial abolition. Now, have you guys heard of this uh, um, woman? Uh, she was a pioneer Black journalist, Black female journalist. Uh, the Delaware-born abol abolitionist and women's rights activist by the name of Marianne Shad Carey. Uh, now, she uh, blazes this trail uh, for African-American women by publishing a newspaper uh, called The Provincial Freeman in Canada. She emigrates to Canada following the passage of that draconian fugitive slave law. Uh, she also publishes uh, in Canada, in Canada West, which is present-day Ontario. Uh, a pamphlet called A Plea for Emigration, 
Um, and through these uh, uh, documents, uh, she advocated emigration to Canada, which she represented as a colorblind anti-slavery empire with a woman at its helm, namely Queen Victoria. So what is she doing? She's um, refashioning familiar American narratives about the supposedly liberating potential of westward expansion by relocating the promise of liberation, not in the American West, but in the Canadian West under uh, the British Empire. And moreover, she's writing women of color, whether slave or in, uh, free, into this migration narrative as citizens, as workers, and as mothers, right? Now, what happens when we follow British imperial abolition into the Indian Ocean? It becomes messy. It becomes inconsistent. And how do we know this? Because the British produced an infrastructure um, which was uh, designed specifically to write marginalized peoples into the historical record as beneficiaries of a benevolent empire, right? And so this infrastructure consisted of police stations and reports and law courts and naval cruisers, uh, bazaar raids, depositions. When marginalized women in their various roles as captives, rebels, refugees, crossed the boundaries of jurisdictional difference over slavery, they generated testimonies. And these testimonies transformed them from slave statistics into names and places, from objects of imperial ben benevolence into mediators between powerful men, sultans and merchants and imperial bureaucrats. Um, and so we can read the language and structures of Britain's imperial uh, diplomacy uh, to figure out the agency of some of these women, right? So let me just show you uh, examples of some of these sources. I use depositions like this um, uh, for in, uh, about enslaved women who scaled the walls of a Mughal uh, palace in Delhi. Think of that as a jurisdictional boundary over slavery and claimed the protection of a British colonial office. Uh, in the early 19th century. Um, now, the king's son claims them as his concubines. Um, and the British are in a stizzy. They're like, oh, uh, what do we do? You know, the children and grandchildren of the king, are they born of women like this? What if the begums, what if the legitimate wives of the king also scale the walls and seek our protection? What do we do? Um, uh, the uh, women are saying, rubbish. We are not the prince's concubines. We were um, uh, independent shopkeepers. We were kidnapped, sold into slavery, and we're being mistreated as domestic slaves. But guess what? They had to prove that they didn't have sexual relations with anyone in the palace before the British would release them, right? But at least in this instance, they secured release, which was not always the case in British India. Now look at a different petition. In this next petition, women rescued by the British from a royal zanana in Oman, Oman in the Middle East, uh, and brought to Bombay, want to go back to their Arab enslavers. Now this, is, uh, this woman, Fatima, she tells you that she was born a Hindu in rural India. Uh, she was kidnapped and sold to a European clerk in Calcutta. Uh, he sexually abused her. The uh, wife, enraged wife, sold her to a slaver bound for Oman, where she entered the domestic service of the mother of the Sultan of Zanzibar, uh, married an Arab, um, uh, converted to Islam, and she doesn't want to go back to Calcutta at all. Now, why? How is, she, how is this woman defining freedom? You know, not as a liberal individualistic impulse, for autonomy under the aegis of an anti-slavery empire, right? Because she comes from a system in which slavery functions not as a racialized, uh, 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 self-reproducing labor force and chattel um, based on the chattel principle, but rather in this system, slavery functions as a way to incorporate kin and dependent circles. 
and enslaved concubines have some prospect for inclusion in the mother uh, master's community, right? And she prefers this to, say, becoming an indentured worker in Mauritius or in the Caribbean. In other words, what you see is that in the Indian Ocean, you have multiracial popula uh, enslaved populations. You have a variety of slaves enslaved statuses and functions. And so the marginalized forge a diversity of relationships with the colonial state. Let me just show you one other example. Meet Mariana, who's whose path to captivity is represented by, if you're following my cursor along the red line there, she was this 15-year-old African woman uh, who was um, uh, taken captive either in Tanzania or Mozambique, carried on an Arab vessel via Yemen to Western India right here, uh, the uh, Arabian seaport of Porbandar, the British tell the local Raja intercept this vessel. Uh, he does, of course, there's lots of drama. There's retaliation uh, in, um, uh, in, in uh, uh, Yemen against Indian shipping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but long story short, uh, the British transport these rescued captives to Bombay. You, uh, I showed you the register, right? So the you can get the names and something about the captives from uh, uh, documents such as this. But what we learn about this woman is that you know, she had been found, uh, you know, concealed in boxes with uh, dozens of other African children aged uh, 6 to 15 amid consignments of limestone and gum incense. So anyway, she's taken to Bombay, but she um, is certainly not docile. She leads all the other African children in a hunger strike against colonial authorities. Um, and when they try to uh, send her to European custodians, she rejects them. She demands either African or Black Muslim custodians. And so, Jan, sorry to interrupt you. I will, I will end right now. Um, so what do these case studies show us, right? Not just the ambiguity of both imperial abolition as well as the relationship of these rescued captives, um, with the colonial state in the Indian Ocean, they also tell us that migration under the auspices of an anti-slavery empire means very different things in different places, right? Context matters. So for um, um, a shark carry, migration meant renewal, reinvention, freedom, equal opportunity. For Fatima, from Oman, it just meant separation from the only community she knew. So she's defying meet polarities of oriental slavery and English freedom. She's defying uh, imperial narratives which mesh British abolition with notions of freedom, Christianity, and colonial assimilation. And so um, what we learn then is that we can mine the many meanings of migration to compare the histories of slavery, abolition, and empire across lands and seas. Thank you. I'll shut up. Thank you to both our authors. Um, so I am going to throw out two questions to both authors that uh, they, so when you spend years, probably a decade, each of you writing these books, guess what? It's like your birthday. I'm going to throw out two questions and I will immediately open it to Q&A from the audience and take two questions from the audience. You as the authors, it's like you're, it's, it's like a buffet. You can ignore my two questions. You can ignore the audience's two questions. You can answer a question that wasn't even asked. But you know what? It's, uh, you guys are the authors. So here's my first question. It's a predictable one from, from me. What is the role of law in slavery and the general subjugation of people? Because in Kevin's story, it sounds like the constitution is the problem that is allowing all these state level terrible restrictions on people. Um, in Gunja's uh, story, it's not clear whether the law is the problem or the solution 
or a little of both? Mm. So that's one question for you both. And the second thing, you know, I've read both books. I encourage both uh, all of you to read it. Uh, Gaston has put the link from our library that gives you uh, unlimited access to both books. So what's striking is that Gunja's book is very bottom up. And the stories that she just presented, you see people who don't have money, don't have power, don't have connections, and, um, and they still have agency and they are exercising that agency to the maximum extent. That's what the bottom up picture of slavery picks up. Kevin's top down story is a very different look at uh, national and subnational governments and, and laws that way. How do, you, how do you capture, I mean, both approaches, you're gaining a lot and you're missing a lot. So is there, I mean, do you, how do you do this? Do you have to just pick with one and go with it? Or is it possible to do two? Do you go sign up a friend and say, okay, we're gonna work on this for 10 years. Okay, you write your bottom up, I'm gonna write top. I mean, how do you even do this? So um, those are my two questions. Let me open it to the audience. You can either raise your hand and I'll call on you. You can virtually raise your hand or you can type your question in the chat. Um, and I will give people a minute to gather their thoughts and to process the two books. Yeah, uh, so Anna, can I, can I make a stab at answering the question uh, sure, that you posed sure. uh, um, as the other questions flood into, into chat? Uh, um, so I, I think that those two questions are very closely related. Uh, one is to do, do with the law, the other is to do with method. And you could say the first question is, uh, should we approach the law as an instrument of oppression? Or could we uh, approach the law as an instrument of liberation? And you can see that that's very um, closely connected to the methodological question. Um, should we approach this from the top down? or uh, from the bottom up. And of course, the, the, uh, I use that word should because it, it, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? Uh, there's no one answer to that question because clearly uh, the law can be an instrument of oppression or it can be used by oppressed people as precisely the medium through which they challenge the system that's oppressing them. Likewise, I mentioned at, at the beginning, I spent my career doing history from uh, the bottom up uh, the history of ordinary people on the move, sometimes involved in protest. Um, and in this particular book, I chose, I made the choice, Anna, that you're referring to. I couldn't do both. Uh, Gunja manages to do both, I think. Uh, in this particular book, I chose not to do both. But I really just wanted to look from the top down at the logic of race and sovereignty that justified this extraordinary claim that some humans can control uh, the mobility of others. And if I want to get to challenges to that, I was just trying to figure out what people are up against. I think what I love about pairing these two books uh, is that difference, because my, my, mine is relentlessly top down and it's, it's deliberately in the context of uh, a single nation state. I just wanted to figure out how did this work in the United States? And then Gunja's book opens us up literally uh, onto the, the whole world, right, um, with the Indian Ocean at the middle. And I just want to throw into the mix, and hopefully we'll get to it later, that the other thing that Gunja's book does is it calls into question the categories uh, that we're using for U.S. history and that we might take for granted. What is freedom if we, if we globalize that question? And what is slavery? What is enslavement? I, I'm working with a model of... Um, chattel slavery that is designed to obliterate uh, the identity and agency of other humans by reducing them to the status of property. Uh, Gunja's life stories of migration through slavery are, are very rich and complex and different. So I'll just throw those thoughts into the, into the mix as we begin. Okay. Gunja, um, yeah. go ahead. What do you, you, you sure. can... Uh so, you know, in the um, interest of saving time, um, 
why uh, don't I uh, merge the two questions that you posed, right, about law and about uh, top-down versus bottom-up structure and agency, and make the point that structure and agency are deeply interactive, I find, right? You can't uh, um, always uh, have, in order to understand how power structures evolve, I think we need to sometimes take into account, certainly in the history of slavery, um, we need to understand um, uh, pressures that were exerted from the bottom up. And let me give you some uh, concrete examples, uh, as my students uh, know well, right? Um, which is, uh, how did uh, slave codes in the United States evolve? Um, uh, many historians have suggested that they, you know, um, the codes to institutionalize a brutal, racialized, reproductive, a self-reproducing labor force, which was also capital, which was also collateral, which was also credit, which could be turned into liquid cash. Uh, that happened at least partly in response to pressures from uh, below. How? When uh, enslaved people mounted insurrections, for example, the Stoner Rebellion, right, in South Carolina, what happens? Uh, colonial legislatures pass a series of police regulations. In fact, a lot of the early slave codes are just that. They are police regulations to suppress insurrections. Or when, uh, let's say, uh, biracial people file freedom suits, they, so they're using the law courts to say, my father is white, my mother is quote unquote Negro, but my father is white, so I should be uh, enslaved. And so what do the colonial legislatures do? They clarify that you inherit your uh, status from your, um, uh, uh, your civil status through your mother, right? It's, uh, so that's one example of how pressures from below can forge these, uh, uh, these structures of oppression. Um, but I also think that in slavery history, marginalized people sometimes use the language and symbols of domination in order to resist those systems of domination. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Shuya Zhang for both of you. Um, and they would like to ask a question. Is there a slavery turn for the histor historiography of U.S. restrictive immigration, uh, U.S. immigration history in the late 19th and early century? Um, and they're referring to Hidetaka Hirota's Expelling the Poor book. Um, so I think the question sounds like, is, is there a is there a historiographical turn toward restrictive slavery or in the night? Is there a, any particular historiographical turn in the 19th century with migration? I think uh, it, it, certainly in my field, which is US history, I, I could see, if I understand the question and it's my interpretation of the question, I could see a slavery turn. And I'll explain uh, what, what I mean by that. Um, and I'm delighted to see Hede Taka, who wrote us expelling the poor mentioned uh, because I had the pleasure of supervising that doctoral dissertation, uh, which became a book. And one of the great things about having an opportunity to, to work with students that way is I wouldn't have written my book if I hadn't uh, supervised that project because it opened um, new areas of history to me. Now, I would see a slavery turn, if, and I, I wonder if we're on the same track here with the questioner as, um, emphasizing what I do in the book, which is that one cannot understand immigration in the 19th century without its uh, entanglement with the fundamental social and political fact of slavery. And that's really the, the, the argument that I'm making in the book. And let, let me give you just one example uh, of that that I, I didn't touch on um, in my presentation, but maybe connects us back out to the wider world that Gunja is dealing with as well. If you look at um, Chinese exclusion, 
I mentioned that there are precedents, just by precedents, I mean in, in a vague, not in a legal sense, but if I'm looking for the treatment of human beings through um, exclusion, deportation, regulation, having to carry papers, having to show papers on demand, being subject to corporal punishment and, and exclusion or removal. I look, I look at those laws that were enacted against the Chinese in the 1860s and 1870s, and I look backwards in American history and I say, where else might I have seen something like that? Well, I, I see it in the antebellum South, and I see it in movements restricting free black people from moving up into into the Midwest or the Northwest, uh, what's today the Midwest, the old Northwest. But here, here, here's a really interesting twist. So I see some precedents in slavery. But if you look at the ideology of anti-slavery, not abolitionism, but the ideology of anti-slavery uh, preventing the expansion of slavery, which is you know the political origins of the Civil War, and you look at the triumph of anti-slavery ideology and abolition in the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment prohibits slavery in the United States, of course, with that awful subclause, except as punishment for a crime. You, you can have enslavement as punishment for a crime in the United States uh, today, and we, we know that through uh, mass incarceration. But if you look at the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment says slavery is prohibited. What I see emerging is a really pernicious and distorted version of the anti-slavery ideology directed at the Chinese, because mm -hmm. Chinese exclusionists and racists in the in the uh, American West then take up that anti-slavery ideology and they say, well, wait a second, you can't have slavery in the United States. But then they claim that the Chinese laborers who are coming to the United States, they call them coolies, are the equivalent of slaves. They're not the equivalent of slaves uh, or enslaved people. You know, they're wage workers, they're entrepreneurs. Some of them are indentured servants. But they make that claim. And the, the logical terminus of that claim is, therefore, the Chinese much, must be excluded because the Chinese laborers are coming and Chinese women are coming as prostitutes. They are the equivalent of slaves. So uh, in my book, I point to uh, a distorted use of anti-slavery ideology. So in answer to the question, those are those are two answers I would give for why I would say a slavery turn in the sense of understanding American immigration policy every step of the way for the overarching fact of American life, uh, mm -hmm. along with westward expansion and indigenous uh, conquest, the overarching fact is the enslavement of, of human beings. Okay. Gunja, let me let you answer the uh, historiographical question, and then I want to get to a student's question from Robert Echevarria in, in a second. Yeah, I think Ke Kevin did an incredible job. Um, so why don't we why don't we get to the students' questions and then just okay. sort of have a whole and then maybe I can return to this. Great. Kevin, Robert, do you wanna uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Um this question is uh specifically for Kevin, but I would love for Professor Singupta to uh chime in as well. Um, what caught my attention in the beginning of, of this discussion was when Professor Kenny described how the U.S. Constitution goes silent or maybe went silent at the time about uh, immigration. You know, seeing how we are a country of immigrants and, you know, specifically our, our Constitution was formed by people who came from Great Britain and, you know, were immigrants themselves. Uh, do you know if there happens to be a reason why there was no mention of immigration in the Constitution? <laughs> Great question. Thank you, Robert. And I'm sure Anna uh, can uh, can answer that uh, question, too. I mean, the OK, the, the first thing is it's it's notoriously difficult to, to figure out the uh, intention of the framers of the Constitution, if, if that's what you're interested in. You know, you, you could pursue it that way. Um, but I, I don't do that kind of work. Uh, but what I will say is, OK, so firstly, this is a federal republic. It's what I call in my book a slaveholding republic where power is dispersed um, and there's deep suspicion of uh, the central government having too much power and the states reserve to themselves uh, 
uh, the sovereign powers that are not delegated to Congress, um, vesting power over the over the movement of people uh, in the central government uh, is it's a pretty um, significant thing. If that same constitution that you're setting up uh, recognizes and protects the enslavement of human beings. It never even uses the word slavery because it has to find other euphemisms, persons held to service, other persons, because this is the foundational document of um, an experimental democratic republic. But it recognizes and protects slavery. Now, if we talk about uh, immigration broadly as the movement of people, some of it is involuntary, some is voluntary. And so the Constitution does say something on that subject. What it says is that Congress cannot prohibit the external slave trade for 20 years. Well, what does that mean? It means, A, Congress is recognizing the existence of slavery for 20 years. And B, if Congress has the power to regulate that kind of human mobility, well, does it have the power to regulate immigration? That's an open question. So it, it's a wonderful question, Robert, and that, that's how I would begin to, to address it. And Anna, sure, surely, if we have time, you would come in with uh, uh, some views on that as well as Gunja. Yeah. I will stay out of it for now. So <laughs> okay. you guys are okay. the guests of yeah. honor. Gunja, yeah. there's a juicy question that Chris Ebert has <laughs> that I would love to hear the answer to for you. He oh. says, you know, for the marginalized people that you're talking about that are navigating these systems of, of, of oppression um, in East Africa and India, in, in the Indian Ocean, how do they get the information to position themselves in such a smart, savvy way to to exercise the agency that you're describing. Like how do they get the information? Right, and um, that is, uh, you know, um, Anna, you had uh, posed um, when we were emailing each other, you talked about some of the difficulties of doing history from the bottom up, right? Th those are some questions that um, uh, are difficult to answer. Um, and you can only um, imagine that um, they use the sort of questioning process. I mean, the petitions are relatively limited, right? They, the petitions basically uh, give these marginalized women options. You can either uh, go back to, uh, actually that is not a real option at all. Uh, basically, the, the, the petitioners are being told, you can do what you want. You were a slave, but you're now a free person. And um, there, there are sort of subtle incentives, you know, you can go into, we'll find you a custodian. You can be a domestic worker in such and such a household, in an European household, or you can sign up to become an indentured worker in the Caribbean, let's say, right, in Guyana. Um, and but, so uh, within the framework of uh, that line of questioning, the women then say, um, no, actually, we'd rather go back to what uh, is most familiar to us, right? So, um, but I think that other historians have also said, uh, talked about the networks the information informal uh, grapevines that uh, develop among marginalized people. You could be talking to um, uh, people on the ship, right? You could be talking to the Nakoda who's uh, dry or, or fellow captives about what your options are. There are sometimes uh, um, differences of opinion, even in a colonial office. And so you sort of, use those uh, loopholes, those silences, your own information networks to make, arrive at those decisions. Okay, thank you. Um, your uh, other colleague, Jocelyn Wills says, could both of you speak to um, the relevance um, to, to now, to the present situation in Gaza? Um, or in 1948, how would you, is there an application 
of what of your books that is there some lessons that we can learn about 1948 and and about the present in Gaza um well one thing I I would say that uh, the main thrust of my book uh, has to do with as I said with the abolition um and legacies of slavery and and um connecting that to, to immigration but I did also in, a, in my earlier remarks refer to uh, westward expansion um, as uh, the other fundamental fact of 19th century um, history. So if you were to think of the United States as a nation state in formation in, in the 19th century, a uh, federal republic, and you'll see that power tilts uh, towards the center uh, during civil war and reconstruction, uh, and it's in that context that a national immigration policy emerges. But the other context is that the United States is an empire in formation mm -hmm. internally. And this is now well established in the historiography that we, we know about the 20th century external empire. But to find its origins, we, we need to look at the process of uh, indigenous uh, expropriation and removal in the 19th century. And so that is actually a, a major theme in the book. It's not the dominant theme. And what I refer to as the plenary power over immigration that we're familiar with now emerges in what was called Indian law, uh, as well as in immigration law, and then in uh, the insular uh, cases uh, after the United States begins to acquire territory. So what's the common the common thread and what might link it uh, to uh, Jocelyn Will's question is the category of settler colonialism. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and certainly, you know, one of the themes of my book has to do with uh, why, um, you know, I compare settler colonialism in uh, North America. You know, why does American style settler colonialism fail in the Indian Ocean? Um, so certainly the theme of settler colonialism uh, would be common. Uh, but I think the other thing is, um, you know, migrations um, have happened since time immemorial. And so I think for, from my perspective, um, when you say that somebody is... Um, um, I feel that we're all from uh, 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 people, our cultures are inherently hybrid and syncretic. And um, I have real problems with um, this notion of, uh, you know, uh, we have, Group A has superior claims to this because I was here before. Um, no, I was here before. Um, I don't think that that kind of an argument leads to a productive solution at all, um, because we all came from someplace. Uh, one thing I would add to Jocelyn's question about the present and in Gaza, um, in the 19th century, we do, we do not have this uh, today. In the United States today, the right to mobility on the right to remain, the right to remain, what is the point of the right to mobility if you can't stay where you choose to go? It is assumed today that you have a right to stay where you go. But in the 19th century, those two were different sets of rights. You may have the right of mobility and you don't have the right to remain. Um, and the states in the United States control both. And right now in Gaza, they're fighting over a very small territory and who has the right to remain. And as Gunja was, was referencing the arguments back and forth of I was here first, I have more claim to it. And, and all, the, all of this stuff is, uh, these are debates that crop up repeatedly. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, recently you may have seen in, in the New York Times, uh, uh, Brad Stevens took on the, the question of settler colonialism, but really, I think from a historian's point of view, reduced it to a caricature. Because uh, what, he, what he was saying is that category is no use because it, it entails that everybody who came uh, unjustly must leave. And I, I don't think that's the claim of, of, of settler colonial scholarship. 
uh, that th that 320 million people should leave the United States uh, today. That's not the, I don't think that claim is being made. I think you can talk about a process of settler colonialism without it lapsing into that. I thought that was a caricature of the concept. There's a question. Oh, no, go, uh, go ahead. For, from, I think there's a question from, let's see, I'm just going down the list. There's one from, um, or is it direct to me? No, here's one from Ellen. Um, in the example that you just gave, Gunja, of the petitioner with the white father and the black mother, is there not a preferred answer in advance, which causes the court to choose among the evidence presented that which will justify the law's preferred position? Uh, true. In, the, in other words, is this really a case of bottom-ups driving precedence, or is it an excuse for justifying what is already law? So uh, may, I, um, may I respond to that? Because I think that's an important question. So uh, before that, uh, uh, before these freedom suits um, uh, uh, were filed, right? There was no uh, law clearly defining, I mean, the, uh, certainly practices were one thing, right? Uh, but there was no codification of practice, formalization of this practice. So how do you institutionalize um, relation, power relations, which may be informal, which may not be written down? Um, there comes a point when you have to sort of uh, draw the boundaries um, and set them in stone. And so that's what uh, some of the, the these pressures from the bottom up did, uh, helped to institutionalize and codify informal relations of power. That was the... That um, uh, Anna, do you, do you think I could uh, follow Gunja's example and address yeah, yeah. one question too, uh, which is Matthew Prado's uh, question um, uh, question, and it's pretty deep. I keep hearing from a lot of people that freedom is a convenient illusion. Uh, what is your response to that? And you know, there are a number of ways in which we could talk about that, and some of them would be, would indeed be deeply philosophical. Um, but uh, I want to give one answer to that in, in the context of what we're doing in these books. And uh, because I had said earlier that for me, Gunja's uh, work calls into question uh, the categories uh, that I'm using in U.S. history of both slavery and freedom. And this gives me an opportunity to mention something fundamentally important to all of us in the United States. And I start all my immigration classes with this, and that is the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment brings the history of immigration and the history of slavery, my two subjects, together. In, in, in this uh, pivotal moment. The 14th Amendment offers the first definition of national citizenship in the Constitution. The Constitution mentions citizenship but it, uh, at both national and state level, but it doesn't say what it means. So 1868, the 14th Amendment is written into the Constitution in response to Dred Scott. The Dred Scott case had tried to deny that African Americans, slave or free, could be citizens of the United States. A civil war is fought over that, and the 14th Amendment settles that issue. And there are only two criteria uh, in the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment. You're born on the soil, or you naturalize, right? So I have the same claim to be a citizen as my American-born uh, children. It's a wonderful thing. It places the United States as an outlier uh, in terms of how you become uh, um, an American, right? But it's still citizenship. And it means that that you have access to all of these rights and privileges based on an accident of birth, right? Uh, you're, you're lucky enough to be born here or naturalized, but we live in the world. We don't just live in America, right? So, so citizenship is both, uh, under the 14th Amendment, is both profoundly emancipatory and it is restrictive, right? It, 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 it sets boundaries. And this is why Gunja's work excites me, because what might be the definition of freedom, Matthew, from a political and constitutional perspective, is found in the 14th Amendment and in Reconstruction. But what might freedom mean uh, in other parts of the world? That's, that's the, uh, the question that I get from reading Gunja's work. 
Well, Matthew and Robert, we are, so, you know, we are talking about the women's suffrage movement in, um, uh, in class, like right now. Like I remind my students a hundred years before, or maybe a little over a hundred years for more reasons than one. Um, I, if I could even be here, I might have been excluded, Kevin, right, under the uh, under the Asian Exclusion mm -hmm. Act. Yep. I, yep. I would certainly not be voting. And so, yes, so freedom takes on um, all kinds of meanings depending on who we are and uh, um, when in time. Why don't I give Gaston the last word because he is our host. Yes. Wow. Uh, what a fantastic evening. What a fantastic conversation. I want to thank Professor Kenny and Professor Sengupta for joining us. Um, I've engaged with your books. I, I read uh, Professor uh, Sengupta's book last semester when we did a book event, uh, event, and I've really enjoyed in the last weeks to engage with Professor Kenny's work. Um, both of them are incredibly rich in detail, but also in the narrative, and that's really hard to accomplish. Uh, so thank you so much for this amazing uh, books. I think Jocelyn Will said in the chat that they were well paired. They were brilliantly paired. And that was done by Anna Law. Uh, oh, so that Anna was Law. done by um, Prudence Cumberbatch. Oh, well, good, congrats. <laughs> well, thank you to <laughs> Professor Cumberbatch and thank you to yes. you for bringing us all together. Um, so thank you so much for that. And then I just want to, you know, I was thinking, uh, I was listening to you at uh, last night's event, which was. Um, with philosophers, uh, right? I mentioned that, you know, as we seek to make a kinder and more just world, we needed to listen to the philosophers, right? And um, I'm a political scientist, so that's a little hard to say. But after mm -hmm. tonight's event, I have to say, we have to listen to the historians. Uh, so thank you so much for giving us a way to sort of understand how we got here so we can imagine a different and perhaps kinder and more just uh, future for us. So thank you so much for everyone who joined us. Uh, please follow us on our social media pages uh, for our next events. And again, thank you, Professor Sengupta, Professor Kenny, Professor. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank I leave you. some Bye. of you. <laughs> <laughs>